again, just for the, for the context of where we are, in case you're new with us, I, the majority of you probably are not, but this entire seminar called True North has been all about the authority of the scriptures and its guidance and, and the authority that we are to give the scriptures to lead us in spite of what the culture around us might teach or, or, or what ideologies people are, are, are grasping and that we have to look at the scriptures because that's what God has given us as the authority. Um, and, and the problem with that is that so much of our culture, so much of what the culture breathes into us, so much of what we digest every single day, uh, man, it's, it's just, it's, it's everywhere, you know. This, this was hitting me as I was studying and preparing for this just the other day. I was with my uh, son at PetSmart of all places. PetSmart, you know, we're just picking out things for the dog. The dog needed food, and every time we get the dog food, we pick up the dog a uh, Another toy, we have a golden retriever that essentially a, a toy lasts for about 20 minutes. So we don't get the toys very often, you know, because we give the dog the toy and <laughs> within 20 minutes the squeaker's out and the head's off and the foam is all over the house. And, you know, so we were just there to pick up a toy. And I, you know, my 12 year old son was standing there picking out toys. And this was an end of the aisle display. You know, that he was standing considering picking up, you know, maybe a rainbow for the dog. And if you can't read the little sign there, it says that PetSmart is proud to support uh, GLSEN with a $100,000 donation. And then it's the next line that gets me the most is that it says to help ensure that every student, not adult, not every dog, this is PetSmart, and it's to help ensure that every student is valued and respected regardless of their sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. And so I only use this picture, I'm not starting out of the gate swinging or anything along those lines, I'm just using this picture to illustrate that the reason we approach these topics is because they approach us. They're there. You're in PetSmart, you're in the line, uh, and you know your 12-year-old son asks you about some of these things and, and, and what all this means, and so the idea is to say, you know, look, this, this is the kind of thing that you, we, we breathe in, you know, on, on a regular basis, and so... Here in the True North uh, series, what we said was that we wanted to use the entirety of the seminar to talk about the orientation of the scriptures of our authority, and then we wanted to start talking about cultural ideologies that Christians breathe in that may seem harmless, but truth is they, they, they detour us off of what God ultimately has for us and, and is best for us, and so we want to use the scriptures to walk us through some of these cultural ideologies. Um, now, let me kind of prep you for how tonight and how next week is going to go. Um, originally, we were going to cover same-sex attraction tonight and gender identity next week. We're still doing that. We're still going to talk about gender fluidity next week. But I started writing, and I just got, over the past couple of weeks, I was writing, 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 pulling all this together. And then I stepped back from it early, early, early this morning, and this was my screen. Um, and when I saw the number of pages, I went, that ain't happening. We're not getting through that in one night. I just wanted you to see what I saw that as I stepped back from it, I thought there's no way we're getting through all of that. And so for the first time ever in the course of my entire life as a teacher, I'm going to try to be realistic <laughs> because of the importance of the topic. Um, so I am intentionally preparing you that we're going to split this into two parts. It's part one this week, it's part two next week, and so that if you're here to hear about the topic, if midweek or Wednesday nights is not your normal thing, I'm just going to beg of you to give us the, the, we only have two more weeks and then we have a summer break uh, where midweek takes a, a, a sabbatical for the summer before we come back in the fall. So, so give us two weeks. We're not going to uh, punt on gender fluidity. These two topics are actually inextricably linked together. So we're still going to cover that under part two, but I'm not going to try to race through to the conclusion of this. Um, and I say all that to say that uh, allow us the benefit tonight. Uh, somebody asked me, they said, are you nervous about the topic? And I said, I'm not nervous about the topic. I'm not nervous to talk about this. I'm never really nervous to dig into the scriptures and, and point to what I believe is the interpretation. I'm nervous uh, as to whether or not it can be conveyed adequately, ex ex especially breaking this into two parts, because there's so much of it. The core for tonight is to set the foundation for what we see or what we believe is the scriptural approach to same-sex attraction and to same-sex orientation. To start, I want us to actually first and foremost qualify the question, what do I mean by that? Uh, years back, I, I shared a little bit of a story last week, and this is kind of a, a very, very similar kind of a story. 
my previous place of employment, we had two offices. We had offices in Bethesda and we had offices in San Francisco. We covered the coast because our clients were across both coasts. And when I picked up Wells Fargo as a client uh, years ago, because they're West Coast based, I started splitting some of my time between Bethesda offices and San Francisco. So I'd fly out and our San Francisco office was out there. And one of our senior vice presidents, a guy I mentioned last week in a story, um, we were sitting down and he just asked me, he said, so tell me, Christian, do you think same-sex marriage is wrong? And I said, it's not a good question. It's not a fair question. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, and I'm going to kind of play this out for you the same way I played it out for him, as I said, the word wrong. I said, I don't know that you and I have the same standard for what's right or what's wrong. I said, let me illustrate it for you. I said, I said just a couple of weeks ago, you and I, Jack, it's not his name, but I'll just I'll say, I said, I said, just a couple weeks ago, Jack, you and I sat down over a, a, how to bill a certain client, and I had a perspective on how to bill them, and you wanted to go significantly higher, and I disagreed with you actually on an ethics-based thing, and you had your opinion of what was right, I had my opinion. I said, if we can't agree on what to charge a client, how are we going to talk about something as big as this? Um, and I said, so we, we have to qualify the question. If you ever have this conversation with anybody else, I would challenge you to just take some time. You're not trying to be a punk, but qualify the question. Do you think same-sex marriage is wrong? Well, you can't answer that if two people use two different standards. And not everybody you talk to views the scriptures as their true north. We do, but others don't. So it's a little bit like, you know, standing in Lowe's and you're there with your friend or your spouse, or, you know, and I've been there with my wife where she'll say, do you think this is, you know, looking at paint colors, and she'll say, do you think this is more green or more gray? And I'll go, oh, that's gray. And she goes, I think it's green. And I go, that's not, that's gray. And she goes, no, it's green. And I go, how do you see, you know, it's kind of like that whole blue-gold dress phenomenon years ago that took place over the internet, you know, was it blue, was it gold, that kind of a thing. Um, to talk about whether something is wrong with somebody, you have to first establish, well, what's our metric here? What's, what's the baseline? And so because we're in a church, because we're here tonight at a Wednesday night, because you're part of a seminar, if you've been a part of the seminar, because we've been talking about the importance of the scriptures, I want to change the question. The question is, do you think same-sex marriage is allowed in the Bible? This is a little bit clearer, but even this is wrong. You say, why is it wrong? Well, because of this word. Sometimes we don't even realize that we get into debates and we're advancing a question, advancing a topic before we even realize it. The, the, the point is, is that I don't really want to talk about same-sex marriage because the scriptures actually have an opinion about same-sex relationships. To jump onto marriage is to suggest that maybe God just has an opinion regarding the covenantal relationship, but maybe he doesn't necessarily have an opinion about same-sex relationships in general. And so you see, the culture can even fast forward. I've said this before. The culture does this with the topic of abortion, and we're not going to go onto a rabbit trail hill. But so many people get bogged down into God's opinion of abortion that we forget that we have completely surrendered on the topic of premarital sex. Still to this day, 2018, over 690,000 abortions took place in this country alone. 85% of those were to unmarried women. So people say, well, what do you think about abortion? I say, well, wait, wait, wait you, you just did the lightning round on me. You fast-forwarded me to a topic. Let's back up for a second. Can we talk about how we even got to that place? Because the scriptures have an opinion about those matters. So I, I want to qualify this word as well, and let's change the question to, do you think same-sex relationships are allowed for in the Bible? But guess what? Still wrong because of this word. Somebody will say, do you think? That's what my friend asked me in, in, in the offices that day at, at Market Bridge. Do you think? Who cares what I think? I mean, seriously, I'm not trying to be facetious, especially when I was having the discussion with him because I wasn't in a full-time pastoral or ministry position at the moment. I, who cares what I think? I mean, you and I could be talking about where to go for dinner, and you could be like, let's go for sushi, and I'm going to be completely against that. I hate sushi. Sushi is disgusting, it is flat out vile. But I have learned, especially in my business travels, that as passionate as I hate sushi, there are people who passionately love sushi. And I have learned that people who love sushi don't really care whether I do or I don't. 
And so when I say I don't like it, they go, then don't eat it. You see, what I think about a topic is probably not going to, in any way, shape, or form, steer you in your decision-making. And so it doesn't really matter what I think, unless you're asking me about what I think God thinks about it. Then that's different. If you're asking me what I think, I can have an opinion, but it doesn't matter. But if you're asking me what I think God thinks, well, now we're getting somewhere, and I think we can land on a better question that I believe is a good starting point and is a good question. What does God have to say about same-sex relationships according to the scriptures? That's a valid question. That is a question that the church not only can answer, I believe the church should answer. If anything, I think the church has been negligent on answering this. I think we have, to some extent, forfeited what is a prophetic calling from God to be his witness on this topic because we have, in some sense, been a little bit scared of of the culture. We've let it intimidate us. Brian shared this past Sunday in his sermon about the story of David and that David came and, you know, ultimately was the one to challenge Goliath. And and if you go back and research that story, part of that story you realize is that The reason that David had the opportunity in the first place is because the Israel army was completely backing down from every single challenge. The scriptures tell us in that story that the Israelite army would go up every single time to the bulwarks. They would hit their spears and they would shout the battle cry and they would, yeah! And then Goliath would come out and say, bring it! And it says that they would retreat. And David shows up and goes, what's the purpose of the battle cry if you're not going to go down there and fight? And he decided to take it on his own because he trusted in in God, it says. And to some extent, I think the church does this. I think we rally inside of our buildings and I think we rally inside of our worship services on Sunday and we cry about how great God is and how strong he is and how much we believe in him. And then we got in the culture and we're like, I'm not gonna say anything. Why? So I think that we need to answer the question and, and, and part of the reason I like this version of the question is that you are completely at license to disagree with me on this question. If I answered the first question, do you think same-sex marriage is wrong, then it's too easy for you to opt out. It's too easy for you to say, eh, you're crazy. It doesn't require anything of you. You can just, the same as the sushi, sushi thing. Nobody loses sleep over my personal preference with sushi. Nobody goes home and goes, man, I can't believe he doesn't like it. I, you know, I need, to, I need to win him over on this. Years ago, my wife was convinced, my wife asked when we first got married whether or not I liked beets. There is nothing I hate more, the only thing I hate more than sushi is beets. That is just, beets. And my wife went down that whole world, all of you have been in this, my wife went down that whole road of you've just never had them. Oh, yeah, I have. No, but I got to make them for you the right way. They were still disgusting. (laughs) And so no one loses sleep over. And so to answer that, but this question, here's the thing. If you disagree with this question, it puts something on you of responsibility. You can say, I disagree. After we get through tonight and next week, you you can say, I completely disagree. Or I disagree with that point. Okay, that's fine. But you have homework to do then. Because if you don't agree with our approach or our interpretation of the scriptures on something, then go do homework. Come back with your approach to those scriptures. You see, what we're doing is we're going to try to, in this, answer the question, what do the scriptures say regarding these issues and how can that ultimately guide us? And if at any point, on any point, you go, I don't know if I agree with that, that is perfectly allowable, it is perfectly fine, but don't cheat us. Go home and do work. Don't just go, well, there's other interpretations along the way. Let me also kind of clarify what we're I'm telling you what we are going to answer. Let me tell you what we're not going to approach in this topic. We're not going to approach whether or not the government has the right to grant civil unions or same-sex unions. We're not going to try to answer that. That, that, That's kind of irrelevant for a church to even jump into. 
There are portions of this that we're going to talk about things like genetics and science, but this is not a genetics discussion. We're not going to try to be, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a geneticist, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a psychiatrist, so we're not going to, we are going to attempt to answer it from a theological perspective. What does God have to say in his scriptures regarding this? Because that is the church's role in the process. You with me? So this is the question, and here is my ask of you. My ask of you is this. A, give us the benefit of two nights this week and next week to get through it. Don't play chess with the topic. And what I mean by chess with the topic is that as we start to go down a certain pathway or talk about a certain scripture, don't go, ah, oh, I know what he's going to say. Oh, he's going to say that. Or he's going to, yeah, yeah. Don't just allow for the teaching. Take notes. You know, it, there's pens. And if you have absolutely nothing to take notes on, my wife loves to use her, her, her notes app. Uh, that she takes notes in. Uh, If you're not a digital kind of a person, take one of the guest visitor cards, turn it over, it's blank on the back side, and grab one of the pens, and take notes. And and when I say take notes, if nothing more, write down some of the passages that you see tonight where you would go, hmm, and go take those to the Lord. Do some work. We, We invite you on that. So where do we start? We've qualified the question. Here's where I want to start tonight. We can't talk about God's opinion regarding same-sex relationships without us even understanding what God's opinion is on sexuality as a whole. The worst thing that we can do, and churches do this, and it is abusive to the word of God in my opinion, the worst thing we can do is rush to the scriptures, search for six or seven verses that say something about homosexuality, and then go boom and use those to just try to force a point forward. The truth of the matter is, is that, and this is what I meant, I said this before, God does not just have an opinion about same-sex relationships. God doesn't, God also has an opinion about heterosexual relationships. Broader than that, God has an opinion about human sexuality because he designed it. He created it. So part of our understanding as the church of our reason to weigh in on any discussion regarding human sexuality is because we hold that the creator designed it. It was his to start with. But as you know, when we talk about midweek, when it, you've heard this a hundred times before, but I just have to set the base for in case anybody has not been here before. When it comes to talking about the scriptures, we have to deal with things in their context. There are words in the scriptures that get attached to the concept of homosexuality and same-sex relationships. Words like abomination, words like depraved. And people love to kind of use those words and to make fast hits, and then the culture gets angry, and then there's a fight. But as we have said over and over and over and over and over again, to interpret the scriptures, we have to do our due diligence. Words in the scriptures only have meaning inside of sentences. If you were to ask me to find the word run, I can't. And unless you give me a context, because I could be like, well, I'm gonna go home tonight and I'm gonna run, or I need to run to the store, or I need to run the air conditioning for a couple of... It, see, the word is dependent upon the sentence it's in, right? In spelling bees, we've all seen the kids, the nervous kids that get up there, and they're spelling the word, and the person says, here's your word, and what's the very next question they've been trained to say? Can you use it in a sentence, please? I, w- I want to hear the context. I want to know that I'm actually spelling the right word because there can be other words related to that. Words have meanings in sentences. Sentences have meanings inside of paragraphs. Paragraphs have meanings inside of the books. I'm talking about the Bible specifically. And those books only have meanings inside of the covenants, the Old Covenant, Old Testament, New Covenant, New Testament. In other words, especially for a topic like this, for all of our interpretation, but especially for a topic like this, we have to consider the entirety of Scripture because the concept of human sexuality and what it is and why God even came up with it in the first place plays out throughout the entirety of Scripture. And to just grab one verse, it's abusive to the text and it's injurious to other people out there. It hurts them. When we just, well, Leviticus 18 says, Romans 1.26 says, abomination, that's the word. And we don't put any context around it. We don't put any sense to guide or to shepherd. And so we need to look at it in its entirety. Here's how we're going to do it. 
This is a little bit of an artificial structure, which means when I say an artificial structure, it means that it is not something that the scriptures, you don't look at the table of contents of your Bible and you don't see these four points there. We could divide the scripture into five parts. We could put it into seven or and put it into eight, and there's other ways you could divide the scripture. Some people put it into the prophets and the writings. But as far as a narrative goes, we understand the Bible. Christians, we understand that the Bible is a whole. It's a unit. That's why we call it the Bible. We don't call it the loose collection of writings. We call it the Bible. We give it a unity behind it. And we believe that the Bible tells a unified story of God's redemption, of God's rescue, of God's salvation. It is a redemption narrative. I have said this before that everybody in here probably you could if I were to say what's your favorite movie and you were to tell me and we all have favorite movies that most of the time our favorite stories are our favorite movies are the the good ones are the ones that have conflict and they've got resolution and then there's you know things that are like friction that's going on and there's an antagonist and a protagonist we love the story behind it even romance comedies have those things you know the scriptures are a story or narrative. They have, it has all the elements of telling this story that has this incredible storyline of God's redemption. And you can put it into four primary parts. The first part is creation. We'll give you a second. No worries, man. I just wanted to see if it was for me. He ordered sushi, and they're having it delivered. Uh, Yes, exactly. The first part of the story is about God's creation. What was God's original intent and design from the very beginning? We have to start there because that is where human sexuality gets its definition. But the problem is that the story doesn't stay static to that. The story then talks about what we call the fall, which is where man disobeys and is separated from God. And what was God's original intent and design gets destroyed. And then there is this incredible story of redemption that flows all throughout about God's plan of rescue, God's plan of restoration, how God ultimately is going to win us back from this area of lostness. And then it ends with this culmination of God's glorification, which tells us God's ultimate design for humanity. And the reality is is that humanity and human sexuality flows throughout the entire narrative. There's purpose to it that most people I would challenge have probably never heard an in-depth instruction about how these things play out. That's what we hope to do tonight as we kind of go through this. Let's start with the creation. And again, we're taking these four parts so that we're not just telling the story of the Bible, the goal is to understand the design of human sexuality inside of that larger narrative and why God even created it in the first place. In the creation, where does it start? Exactly where you think it starts. In the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Why is this key? Why do I start here? Because most of the debate today When you talk with people in the culture, there are all kinds of argumentation that talk about follow the science, suggesting that we start with genetics, or a person will say, if, if a person is born a certain way, then that's how God designed them. And ultimately, people jump into science and, and, and physics and, and biology and chemistry and genetics, and there's all of these starting places. But for us, it starts with this notion of In the beginning, God. God started everything. Science explains God. God does not follow science. Science explains the processes that God has put into place, or tries to explain anyway. But you kind of see, if you consider Lady Gaga's song, and if you don't know who Lady Gaga is, that's your first homework, because I am not going to illustrate that one for you. I'm not going to sing it. Jeremiah could maybe help us on that later, but... Uh, in her song, you know, we can always kind of get the pulse of the culture just by picking up some of the culture's music, especially that culture that is most celebrated. But Lady Gaga's song, Born This Way, which essentially is a celebration and also a defense of the trans and same-sex culture sense is to suggest, I was born this way, and because I was born this way, that is why it is okay. Those aren't the lyrics, that's just the best I can do in rhyming. 
Part of her lyrics, she says in it over and over and over again in the chorus, part of the chorus is, I'm beautiful in my way because God makes no mistakes. You see, the culture, even if the culture doesn't suggest any kind of an affinity to God, the culture wants to have the ethical conversation. Because in those little words, those small little words, whether she intends to or whether she doesn't, I think she does. I've read, I've seen some interviews around the song. I've read some uh, 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 books that she's talked and defended the, the lyrics behind this song, especially when it was first released. But this makes a statement about God more than it makes a statement about the transgender life. That it says off the, right off the bat that how we're born is how God intended to make us. But that's not true. We're going to make that case in a moment when we get to the segment of the fall in the narrative. But to make the case, well, God has made me. That, and, and then there is an ethical assumption that the culture makes, which is this. And, and here's when, when that phrase is used, I was born this way. The assumption is God is not allowed, nor would God ever judge somebody for how they were born. Because to the culture, that reflects negatively on a God. Why would a God judge someone for how they were born? And so they will say, the church is a bigoted community. The church has an incorrect perspective on who God is. And the church, or the culture, without our witness, without our jumping into the conversation and help clarify these things, the culture makes their own opinion about their own God. They say, no, we see God as love. We do not see that God judges. We see that God made us this way. And because of that, I'm going to defend my own stance. The church just has a real bigoted view of him. Their, you know, their notion that... But you see, they don't know the story. It's like commenting on a movie when you've never seen it. I've met people that have said, I think Star Wars is dumb. And I say, tell me about it. Well, I've never actually seen it. <laughs> when people make assumptions about God and who he is. But you see, the way in which the story of creation opens is this. God created everything. And it automatically separates the creator from the created. Guess, guess, which, guess which bucket we're in. We're in the created bucket. We're not in the creator bucket. That is a place uniquely designed for him. The Christian, A Christian ethic about God, about sexuality, about anything, starts with the notion that we are separate from the Creator. We do not sit in a place to judge Him. We do not sit in a place in any way, shape, or form to fully understand all of His design, especially as a fallen world. Part of the narrative, there's a, there, there's a part of the story, a part of the movie where this man, Job, goes through, just goes through hell on earth. Literally because Satan's behind it. Death, destruction, the loss of income, the loss of a job, the loss of family, property. And he goes through 36, 37 chapters worth of just questioning, where is God in this? And why is God? And what is God? And what about his purposes? And, and Job's friends come and they have all of these theories about why God would do this and why God would do this. They have theories the way that Lady Gaga has a theory about God and, and questioning about God and, and, and trying to figure God out. And then finally, God shows up towards the end of the book. You go through 37 chapters where God doesn't say a word 37 chapters of just theorizing. And then he shows up. And this is what God says to Job right off the bat. Where were you when I created everything? What's the answer? I wasn't there. Exactly. And it's not God trying to be a punk, although when you look at the language, he's rather direct with Job. The very next line, he says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? I didn't paste it here, but the next line is that God says to Job, tell me if you know. And then there's this litany that God goes through. Where were you when I set up the boundaries of the oceans, when I marked the foundations of the earth? Where were you, Job? And the answer over and over and over from Job is, I wasn't there. 
And that story is intended to show us, and Job is not, and God's not trying to ridicule Job, but it sets the contrast for Job begins to understand that for him to try to put himself into the mind of God, to God's purposes, to God's design, to try to take the role of the creator when we weren't even there at the beginning. The Christian ethic starts with allowing that our creator designed everything according to his intents and his purposes, and he has given his word, but he is still the creator, and what he designs and how he designs it, we give him that superiority on everything, not just human sexuality, on everything. Our worship of him is that he is separate from us. He alone is God. He speaks to the prophet Isaiah. And says specifically, my thoughts aren't yours. My ways aren't yours. And they're not said, that's not said with a harshness, but it is said in a manner that keeps putting the created back in its appropriate place of understanding. That when we say things like, God can't judge me because I was born this way, you're taking the seat of God. Even if you think your question has relevance, it says something about a little bit of an arrogance. And so as Christians, we start with this notion that God's sovereignty, that God is the designer, that God is the creator, that how God designed it, how God created it, how God did it, how God, whatever his plans were, whatever his points were, we start with saying he and he alone gets to define right, wrong, true, false, you follow. That a proper theology of the scriptures, a proper theology of the story, of the narrative, starts with the creation, and we weren't there. God was. And he created. And what is learned, if you were part of our In the Beginning class, what is learned is that when God created He did a masterpiece that God did not just some plants, some trees, some water, some animals, call that one a walrus, don't know why, but big teeth, you know, mosquitoes, who knows why, but mosquitoes, fish, we'll turn it into sushi, Uh, you know, it wasn't random. Matter of fact, we went through this, and we're not going to dig into it tonight deeply. If you want to go into it deep, go online and find our In the Beginning course and go through it as well. But what we discovered was that one of the number one questions people have when it comes to the creation story at the beginning of Genesis is, why is everything out of order? Day one, it says there was morning and evening, there was night and there was day. But the sun and the moon actually don't get created until day four. Let that one ponder under your head. And what we discovered was that the story of the creation is not intended to teach a scientific account of the creation. It's intended to teach a theological account. And what you discover is that God creates into the creation design that is intended to reflect him. He creates spaces. He creates what are called kingdoms, and then he creates rulers. That's why it says on day four, he creates the sun and the moon, and he says, and they will rule over the day and over the night. And the reason he's doing that is because he's a creator. And so he creates into his creation design so that the creation can better understand him. All of his creation is an illustration of who he is. And you understand the value of an illustration. Every single Sunday, I guarantee you, you understand the value of an illustration. Somebody's up here speaking. Somebody's up here preaching, and they're covering a point. They're covering a passage. They're trying to convey point two of our message, point three of our message. And all of a sudden, they they jump into a story. They go, one time, or once this, or my wife locks the keys in the car, but I don't. Sorry. And there is an illustration in the message. And when they tell the illustration, if the illustration is good, if it's powerful enough, we go, I get it now. Because maybe you didn't fully get the point when it was the passage. Maybe you didn't fully get the breakdown of, of the passage or, or the word or, or the point was. But all of a sudden, a person tells a story and you go, oh, I, now I, uh, because the illustration paints a picture. And we go, now I get it. God was smart enough 
that when he started creating, he intentionally put into the creation the stamp of who he was so that the creation could comprehend who he is. So that the physical would illustrate the spiritual. And we see all throughout the scripture, repetitively over and over and over again, how this brings about worship. David writes in Psalm 8, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you set in place, what are we that you care about us? I've said this before, but have you ever stood in front of a sunset and gone, just wow? For me, I mean, I love sunsets, don't get me wrong, but one of the things that most conveys or one of the things that gets me to stand in awe is when we get nor'easters or hurricanes here. And I love to get down to the ocean when it's going to be a high tide and it's at the peak of the storm and you see the ocean just overrunning everything. And I just go, man. And it is this inspiration to know that God designed and put meaning into that. His creation carries his design. We see it in the book of Isaiah. To whom then will you liken God? How, how, how would you compare God? What likeness would you use to compare God? I mean, think about it. who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Do you not know? Can you not hear? Haven't you ascertained this from the very, very, very beginning? Notice the last question. Haven't you understood from the foundations of the earth his image, his likeness, his character, who he is, his qualities, his attributes? He has put them into his creation. If we care to look, if we care to study, if we care, we learn about him. Why do I start with all of this nonsense about creation and creator and design and, 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 and art? It's because, like I said, we have to interpret the scriptures in their context. When it comes to homosexuality, Christians, one of their hallmark passages is Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. God gave them over to depraved minds to commit acts indecent acts. That's my, how I see the church sometimes. And that is in Romans chapter 1. But you know what else is in Romans chapter 1? Paul speaks about this creator. Paul says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his power, his nature, they have been clearly seen. They've been understood from what has been made so that truthfully, we're without excuse. And if you understand the angle that Paul's taking, Paul is not trying to beat people over the head. Paul is saying, God has not hidden himself his attributes, who he is, how he loves, how he relates. It is within his physical creation from the very beginning. Every single element of it has purpose. You ever seen those, I forget what they're called, the pictures that are made of just dots? I'm waiting for somebody to yell it out. One of you, no, no art teachers. What is it? Pointillism? Okay. But you know what I'm talking about? Nobody has a clue. You've never seen one of those paintings that's made up of just dots? Nobody's ever seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Just try to use an illustration? Nobody got it. Where they're in the art museum and he zones in, zones in, zones in, where you, you get close, you get close, you get close, you get close, and then you realize that it's actually not a paint that the artist made it out of just dots. And you go... Man, you get close enough and it's just millions of dots, but if you stand three feet away, it looks like a cohesive picture. That God's design is like that, that there are just every single little point has meaning. 
And Paul sets up this statement that before we jump to Romans to try to make a case about homosexuality, let's first understand that Paul, in the context, is trying to make this point that God puts meaning. God illustrates himself in the creation. And you want to know what the best part of his creation is, according to him? It's you and me. Romans, or Romans, Genesis chapter 1. And then God said, let's make humankind in our image. We've made the sun, the moon, the stars, the day, the sky, the seas, the land, the birds, the reptiles, the plants. But humankind, let's directly stamp our image. This is, we get the picture much the way we see the Trinity talking in Revelation in God's court, we get the image of the relationship of the Trinity in Genesis, of the Son and the Father and the Spirit talking and collaborating, and the statement is said about you and I that is not said about any other part of the creation, that as much as God puts his stamp and his design inside of all the creation, he gets to us in the story and in the narrative, and he says, them, let's directly stamp our image there. Let's directly illustrate ourselves, so much so. This is, this is a, a writing style in the Hebrews, that, that, that repetition in Hebrew writing, especially because it's a poetical nature. The more you say something over and over and over and over again, it's given for enforcement. Four times in two verses, God makes the point that we are going to, we, when we were created, he directly stamped his image into us. That while we can see him through the sky and the trees and we can understand things as we begin to understand why it is that he likens the spirit to wind and, and how wind moves and you see it and then there's effects. As much as the creation illustrates things, as much as over and over and over again, the creation is used as an illustration to show how he moves when it says things like, and they will mount up with wings like eagles. And we go, an eagle, I know that, yeah, you know, as opposed to they will mount up with wings like a robin, and you go, robin, squirrels eat robins, but eagle, we go, I got an eagle. As much as God puts his design in the creation, us, a direct stamp, he says. Humanity will directly be the image, carry the image of us as the creator, you and I. And it's right here where sexuality starts to take place. Because the writing in the text says that they say four times in our image, in our likeness, in our image, in the image of God, he created them. And then it says this, male and female. Why two? I don't know. Guess why I don't know? Because I wasn't there. Remember? When God says, where were you? I wasn't there. Could have been three. Could have been seven. Could have been one. Could have been none. He could have made us as androgynous robots. But it doesn't matter what I think because as a Christian ethic, I wasn't there. He's the creator. It's his design. He gets to decide. And he says, I cr we're going to put our image not just in one of them, but in both. And specifically, it's not just that they each get it equally, it's that our image will be in their duality. That as they are male and female together, collectively, they will carry our image. Not they each get it equally and go, get to go do what they want with it. You ever done this with your kids? You go, hey, you guys, we're leaving. Get dinner for yourself. Here's $10 for all of you. It's not here's $10 for your dinner. Here's $10 for yours. It's here's $10 for the collective. Work together to solve it. He gives it to both. And that's the scriptures. This is the first instance which begins to talk about God's design process for sex. Male, female. Duality. Together, we somehow 
illustrate him. Now, we are pretty ignorant about how. Part of that's because there's a part of the story called the fall that we haven't even gotten to yet. But it's there because the scripture says so. And I don't know about you, but I go, I want to know. How do we give the image of who he is? I want to research this. I don't know that they do this anymore. When I was a kid, dad would come home and buy cereal. And on the front of the box, there'd be a picture of something inside. A toy. Something. And we'd be like, open it up. And dad would bring home the groceries like at night. And so it would be nighttime. We'd be like, suddenly we'd be like, oh, I'm hungry. Uh, can I have cereal instead? And mom would be like, nope, we're having broccoli. Thank goodness it was never sushi. Broccoli or something like that. We'd be like, no, can I have cereal? But we didn't really want cereal. What do we want? The prize. And so, and then we would get in so much trouble because they hadn't invented Tupperware when I was a kid. Um, nobody had come up with the cereal boxes that we have in our house today. Now when we buy cereal in our house, we open the plastic container, pour the cereal in, and it stays fresh the whole time. But when I was a kid, there, nobody had come up with that idea, or we couldn't afford it, we were too poor, so we kept the cereal in the box. And so we would take the box, and we would open it up, and we would tear it, and the cereal would go over and then we would do this. You, you know what I'm You'd bend the box, and we would shake it. And then we'd put our hand into it, and you know, the same hand that was like, you know, dig it in the box. I want to know. I see the picture on the front, but I want the real thing. Your passion for the scripture should be kind of like the... Uh, God says that on, in us is the image. But what is it? What is the... I want to know what it, that is. And believe it or not, the scriptures tell us. The scriptures, actually, if you care to dig through the narrative... The scriptures tell us how God stamped his design into us. First and foremost, we reflect that he's a relational God who desires us. Inside of us, the image he's put in us, the physical illustration that he put on earth reflects that he, as a God, desires us, that we were created for him, specifically, let me, let me break this down. Genesis 2.18, it says, the Lord God said, and you just said, well, wait a second, in Genesis 1, he automatically already said male and female, yes, but then you get into Genesis 2, and the narrative starts to unpack it a little bit. It backs up and says, let's unpack that thing. We just, you know, Moses wrote in the scriptures, God takes his image and he stamps it into this duality of genders, male and female, but then, but let's unpack this. Why? Why two genders? The scriptures tell us. The Lord God said this. It's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a companion. A companion who corresponds to him. I want you to lock in on that word corresponds. Who corresponds to him. If you're a New English translation, an NET user, and if you're a student of midweek, you undoubtedly are an NET user by now. And if you're not, what am I doing as a teacher? <laughs> but the NET, which carries over 66,000 notes, that is not an exaggeration, 66,000 plus study notes, you look at that correspondence and it will tell you that the Hebrew term here, connecto, literally means that the companion was opposite, and that translations such as suitable and the better, the best translation, I think, is exactly what you see in the New England, the, the word they pick, which is that the female, the woman, corresponds. And I love what the NET re reads in here. It actually gives you a little bit further. It says that translations that render the phrase simply partner are missing it. God didn't just make a partner. He made female, opposite to male, and they would correspond. He didn't clone. Catch this. He didn't say, man needs a friend. I will clone him, and those two will be good buddies. He says, man needs not be alone. I will make a companion who corresponds. That word corresponds means that they are opposite, and they only know their fullness of their potential when they are together. 
that word corresponds carries so much in this. And then the story goes on, and it's a love story. If you've never heard it as a love story, I'm going to try my best to tell you it as a love story. Because it is a love story. The very next verse says, So the Lord God, after going, I don't want man to be alone. It says that God then formed out of the ground every single animal, every bird of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what the man would name them, what would the man call him. He wants to see the man's reaction to these things. And so the man goes and names all the animals, the birds of the air, the living creatures of the field. But for Adam, there was no correspondence. Nothing fit. Nothing worked. Nothing else encountered. And it says, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was asleep, he took a part of the man's side. And then he closed that up with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from that part he had taken. And when he made her, he brought her to him. Next week's we'll talk about why prepositions are important. Pronouns, not prepositions. And it says that Adam looked at her and said, maybe you've never heard it this way, because we think of it in terms of church language. This one is, at last, bone of my bones. That is not what he said. He went, that one! How do I know that? Because the narrative intentionally is trying to, by, by crafting all this thing about the birds and the animals, God knew what he was doing, but the narrative is intended to show what correspond means. It intentionally says that God brought every other possible companion, creature, everything else he had created, and nothing works, and then God brings her, and Adam goes, that one, that one, that's the one. <laughs> We watched a romantic comedy the other night because every so often I have a soft spot in my heart for my wife's genre taste. She puts up with Avengers. She likes it. She puts up with Star Wars, with explosions, but my wife is a sucker for the romantic comedy. So we watched an old one. Meg Ryan and Tim Rollins? Robbins. IQ. I'm just showing you how old I am because half you're like, I have no clue what that movie is. It's not recent. But she's already in love with somebody. He's alone. She's Einstein's niece. That's why it's called IQ, but for other reasons. And he takes Einstein on a ride on a motorcycle, and he gets Einstein really fast, in the motor, and Einstein's never been on a motorcycle. And then he does this jump over this hill, and Einstein goes, Wahoo! and they hit the thing and he turns around and he goes wahoo and he goes have you never gone wahoo and you know it's coming because there's that moment that Tim Ryan sees Meg Ryan and Meg Ryan sees Tim Robbins and they go wahoo that's the one for me we love those movies is there not a pulse here tonight were you not created you've got mail have you ever seen that movie I hate romantic comedies, and I cry that you've got mail. Because they come to the end, and they've hated each other the whole movie, but they come to the end. They don't know that they are the mail court. They've been corresponding through email. In real life, they're, 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 they're business people that hate one another, but they met in a chat room, and so they think they're in love with this person in a chat room. But da, 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 And then they get to the end, and they come to the park, and he's walking the dog, and he comes around the corner, and she's crying. And she goes, I wanted it to be you. I always wanted it. And you're like, yes, that's the one for you. Because at the beginning of the movie, they're both, they have other partners, but their partners are losers. And you're spending the whole movie going, don't marry that guy, he's a loser. But when they meet at the end, you're, you're crying because you go, they, they, they go together. That corresponds. Adam goes, of everything else, she is for me. Not another guy. I don't say that sarcastically. I say that intentionally because it's intentional to the text that she was created specifically to be his direct corresponding counterpart. And sexuality from the very beginning, the design of the genders from the beginning, the reason God does that 
is because he works into the fabric of the physical what he wants the physical to understand about him. That the same way that the man looks at the woman and goes, her, she is who I want. We are supposed to understand that God created us to go and they are who I want. It's woven into the fabric of the story. God designed us to be with him. He created us different from everything else. He has no affinity for the animals or for the other things the way he does for us. We are the only ones that got the stamp of his image, of his likeness, of his creation because we were created for him. And God says, I will illustrate that through two genders. And the love and the correspondence they have will reflect that I am a relational God that desires them. It's woven into the story. And if you've never heard the scriptures, that's the narrative. But it doesn't stop there. We don't just reflect a relational God. We reflect a creational God. A God who loves to create, a God who loves to give life. And so he doesn't just create male and female so that they can hang out in the park, go to the arcade. Boy, that's dated because there's no such thing as an arcade anymore. Go to the beach, the boardwalk, go for sushi. No, he creates them. And he gives them something called sex. It's in the story. You go, it is? Yeah. Genesis 1.28. Because once he creates them and once he brings them together, he says to them, be fruitful, multiply. Let me get rid of the terrible English jargon. What he said was, have sex. Told you we were going to go there a little bit. Have sex, because that's, I want you to. And out of that sex, life is going to come. One of the most awkward moments of my life ever, ever, was my honeymoon. No, not because I had not been with my wife yet, but because the morning after, her mom called us on our honeymoon. We're in Hawaii. Her mom calls us. Think about the time difference from the East Coast to Hawaii. Her mom calls us the morning after. Did you have a fun night? (laughs) My wife is like, Mom. And she's like, and and my mother-in-law called to say, hope you're having good sex. (laughs) Honeymoon's over. Mom may as well be here with us now. You have to, and you have to know my mother-in-law. My mother's one of the most godly, spiritual. I mean, she's passed on, but she was one of the most godly, spiritual, quiet ladies. So for her to call and say, are you having good sex? I didn't know. I didn't even have a category to put that in. I was like, ew, 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 ew. <laughs> my wife was like in bed going, ew, ew, ew. But this was a lady that had experienced it her whole life. And she had spent her whole life raising her daughter going, no, 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 no. And now it's finally, yes, yes, yes. And so mom's like, isn't it awesome? (laughs) Have sex. That's what God says. But here's the thing. He doesn't say it just because of the physical pleasure behind it. He gives it a capacity. It brings life. He doesn't just say have sex. He says, multiply, have kids. Why? Because he's, he designs into the creation the image of who he is. He creates. He wants relationship with us. And when we receive our creator, he gives us life. And so in the physical, the man is with the woman, and as she receives of him, there is life. His design and his stamp is in the entirety of it. It teaches who he is. He is a relational God who desires us. He is a creational God that brings life, and in the image of his masterpiece of his creation, he is teaching and showing who he is. And it is an awesome illustration Because sex is amazing. Not one amen on that one. (laughs) Tons of laughter on the sushi. 
Nothing on the sex is amazing. Only God could come up with that. I think sex is the only experience. How many of you are like, right now, I get the feeling people are like, move on, move on. No, it's sex. Why are we scared to talk about this? Sex is the only thing in the world that you never, ever, 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 ever get tired of. Ever. Maybe for a little bit. But you go to an amusement park and you could ride a roller coaster and you get there and you're like, oh, the coasters, I love it. And you ride it and you ride the roller coaster and maybe you ride the roller coaster six times and by the halfway point of the day, you're like, I'm done with that thing. That never happens with sex. <laughs> Only God could create something that illustrates that he is never tired of us. Ever. For all the fun that we're having, please understand the Genesis story is not some boring theology about, in the beginning, God. He is putting his design and his stamp. He is enjoying it. We don't just learn that he's a relational God. We don't just learn that he's a creational God. We learn, we learn that he's a familial God. He wants a family. What is the picture the number one picture that most people understand from the book of Revelation about when we reach the glorification. When we go to heaven, what is the picture? It is a table. That is the primary image that God gives in, that we are going to sit around a table and we are going to eat and we're going to talk and we're going to laugh and even yours truly is going to say, I kind of like being with people. <laughs> Isn't that the best experience in the world to be with friends and family around a table? We're Marylanders. We understand that because we love crabs. Nobody ever, uh, there's always an exception, but nobody ever goes and gets crabs on their own, right? Nobody goes, I'll go and get a dozen crabs on my own and sit by myself at a table. I know there's exceptions to the rule, but as Marylanders, we understand crabs are a relational food. You go with friends because the crabs, you eat seven, eight, nine crabs, have some conversations, an hour later, you're like, I think I still need a cheeseburger. Crabs are not sustenance for it's relational. God is familiar. How do I know that? Because here's what he says. Also in Genesis, the man will leave his father and mother. He unites with his wife. They become one family. And there was no shame. Sin had not entered the picture yet. I don't have the time to go into it tonight, but just real quick. It's all pain, every little dot. Why is it the man that leaves? And not the woman. Why doesn't it say, and the woman will leave her family and join her husband? Why is it that the man will leave? Because God had anticipated long before you and I ever even were there. Because again, were we at the creation? No. But God had anticipated there was going to come a day where Christ would have to leave his father and come for his bride to create what we call the church. That's why the scriptures tells us that Christ was actually, his, it says, slain before the foundations of the world. It had been anticipated, planned for, but it is put into the creation that there is the intentionality that they will come together, they will create family of their own, they will have children, male, female, correspond, sex, kids, family, and all of that has intentionality into it because God wanted the creation to be able to have a picture to understand who he is. As much as it's awesome in of its own self, it is illustrative of him. He's a God that desires us. He's a God that when we open to him, life comes forward. He is a God desires family. He put his own stamp in us. And he did it male, female, that can join through correspondence. And in that correspondence, there can be life and there can be family. And Satan was able to convince us 
to leave that. Satan came and said, do you really want to correspond to him? Is that the position you want? To correspond to him? You know the reason he's holding out on you on that tree over there? It's because he knows that if you go and eat, you'll no longer have to correspond to him. You can be his equal. You'll be like him. Think of the complete foolishness of the lie. We just saw in the creation account that God said that when he created us, it was in his likeness, in his image, everything put in us. And Satan comes and breathes this notion of corresponding is not good enough. And so we separate from God. We break. And the story of the scriptures takes this terrible, tragic, dark pivot where God shows up in the garden the equivalence of a man coming home to find his wife in bed with somebody else. The, the, the movie would, would the, the, the picture, the camera would pan across a fireplace mantle showing pictures of, of happiness and kids and soccer games and graduations. It would show pictures of their marriage. But you would have knowledge in the movie that she was in the bedroom with somebody else and he had come home and all of that was about to completely collapse. It says that God comes into the garden and says, Adam, where are you? I hid. Why? I was afraid. I was naked. And right there, right there, Adam's response to God is, I was naked. Sexuality goes... And plummets. Why? Because Adam disconnected from the source of life, from the source of relation, from the source of family. He disconnected, and sexuality starts this plummeting. It's interesting that we call it the fall because it's kind of like a person on the top of a skyscraper who jumps. And while they're falling, they're not dead, but they're certainly headed in that direction. And there's this fall, there's this plummet, there's this jump off. And all of that design I just told you about, all of the beauty of that illustration that God puts into it, all of that is trashed. It is the equivalent of a painting on a wall that is a masterpiece that a person put all of their time and investment into, and somebody would come along with knives and just... It is shredded to pieces. Sexuality just... The image is destroyed, distorted, blown apart. Did I say we have to do this in two parts? And so this is where we're going to pick up next week. We'll get through it, don't worry. Not necessarily in the way you think, but we'll get through this. But at the very least tonight, we've set the standard, we've set the foundation that sexuality... Gender is all intentional by God. Not so we could just have pleasure. Not just so we could have fun. I've heard terrible sermons about how God just wants you to have fun. Oh, as if he's just some simpleton up in heaven going, well, let's see how kind of a cool roller coaster ride we can come up with. Oh, he put his design into his creation so that the creation, the same way that you and I, when we hear an illustration of a sermon and we go... The intention, the idea was, was that we would look at the physical creation and go, now I get him. I understand him. But sin distorts all of it. And when we pick up next week, we're going to see just how bad that distortion gets. We lose. We get divorced. We get thrown out of the house. We're on our own. There is no life-giving ability anymore. So what does humanity do? Humanity starts sleeping with prostitutes. Humanity, you say, really? It's the imagery God uses all throughout the Old Testament. 
My people whore after prostitutes. He, the reason that God uses sexuality so many times in the Old Testament is because that was the image that he started with. And so we're like, this, the, in the fall, the Old Testament is a picture of a spouse that is walking through back alleys with no money, strung out on drugs, sleeping with whoever will allow it. No house, no home, no covering, no anything. You see, sexuality, we, we can't jump straight into same sex or homosexuality or it's, it's wrong. We have to understand why. Why is God so passionate? And we set the foundation tonight that we'll pick up with next week. I'm going to end there.